So we're looking at Salvation by Bruce Hurt. So what he wrote now, I've answered a number of things in black font here. Not the least of which is I did a study on eternal security, which he negated and I answered. I did this study on eternal security, a detailed study, all the way down to point 10, which is here. Point 10, upon believing in Christ as Savior, the individual immediately, let me move this down a little bit, the individual immediately begins having eternal life in his mortal body, never to lose it, since it is by definition eternal in life. Begins and never ends. Let's see if we can get that back up all the way down to ten. And of course, never to lose it since it's eternal. The, the key here is. Where would he look first? I'd look at John 3.16. This thing likes to run around all over the place. I've used this so many times. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for your sins. And whoever believes in him Whoever's the believing one in him is literally translated, should not perish, but have eternal life. Present tense, possession. Whoever believes is hope is strong, a nominative meaning a noun, present participle, the believing one, indicating one who is believing in Christ his Savior in the present tense, resulting in a state of never perishing and having eternal life beginning at the time he became the believing one, shall not perish, may not, apolitai, perish. It's a completed action, subjunctive mood, depending upon the most the reliability of God, because he's reliable, indicating a once-for-all-time exclusion from the perishing as a result of the present state of believing in Christ as Savior to become the believing one. And the, the phrase, verbal phrase, shall have eternal life. Actually, it should have subjunctive mood. Should have eternal life. It's objective possibility depending upon how reliable God is. How reliable is God? Absolutely. So it's a done deal. Present subjective participle indicating a continuous forever state of having eternal life from the then present time period, which began when the believing started, when you became the believing one, Note that eternal life would have to be a forever condition, otherwise it would not be eternal life. If you think you can lose it, think again. It wouldn't be eternal. God is the provider, so it must be eternal. Kenneth Wiest states, In the words, should not perish but have everlasting life, there is a radical change in tenses from the aorist which speaks of a once-for-all act to the present subjunctive, which speaks of a continuous state. The contrast is one between the final utter ruin and lost estate of the unbeliever. You can fix that spelling there. And the possession of eternal life as an enduring experience on the part of the believer. Let's go. B E L I V E R, and then correct it. B E L I E V E R. That's why I like to, to work with the original. At least I can fix a few typos here and there. Yep. Oh well, it's fixed. 
In any case, in the same way that physical life is an intrinsic part of an individual, so eternal life, once received, becomes an intrinsic part of the individual. When he believes in the Son of God, he becomes the believing one. His payment for your sins, he believes in that payment, and thereby receives eternal life. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Notice that eternal life becomes the present possession of the individual the moment he expresses believing in the Son being given for him. He stops expressing it, doesn't matter. He has possession, intrinsically, now as a part of him, of eternal life. And how long is that possession going to be? By definition, forever. John 6, 53-54. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no eternal life in you. Notice that the word life refers to eternal life. In the context leading up to verse 53. This eternal life once received is described as here as in you, implying an intrinsic part of you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Since eternal life once received is in you, implying an intrinsic part of you for eternity, then it is not portrayed in the Bible as occupying space in a particular part of your anatomy such that it can be removed and lost from within you and then recovered again. Furthermore, the concept of eternal life existing outside of an individual this is comparing apples and oranges. The concept of something cannot be compared to the possession of it. The concept of eternal life is one which is forever everlasting, without end, and of course, but the eternal life of a particular individual does not exist until he believes, and at that time, at which time, the eternal life cannot go out of existence because of some infraction. You go to sleep and you dream of the topping of pizza you would like to eat, and must be, by definition, must be an intrinsic part of that individual's existence, Forever. An individual's eternal life cannot be measured apart from any individual any more than an individual's physical life can be measured apart from the individual's physical existence. Say, so here's my friend over here. Oh, he's alive over there, but here he comes. No, see, the concept of life can be discussed in general, but that discussion does not apply to an individual who does not yet possess physical life or eternal life. Finally, even if it could somehow be lost, it could not be described as eternal life, but life for the duration of time that it was an intrinsic part of that individual. Thus, eternal life is eternally secure because it is defined as an intrinsic part of the individual for the duration of eternity. But let's do a hypothetical test of this, <clears throat> assuming one can lose one's salvation, repent, and recover it again. A man lost his salvation ten years after he got saved. Later on, he repented and regained eternal life, if that were possible, and it is not. He'd have to change the meaning of all these words in the dictionary, at which time he dies. Hence, is the length of his eternal life one eternity plus ten years? See how nonsensical it is? Consider that once physical life begins, an individual exists. Once it leaves an individual, the individual ceases to exist as he originally began to exist. Hence, he is destroyed. Portions of that creation may and do continue to exist, but in a totally different format wherein the physical body <clears throat> is a mass of matter, dead, lifeless, no longer containing a soul or spirit, which the latter entities occupy other space. The context of the argument does not permit entering <clears throat> into this any more than you can say that water can lose its oxygen. If it lost its oxygen, it'll just be hydrogen. Just as the oxygen is intrinsic to the existence of the water, and losing it would destroy the water, albeit change into something else, which no longer functions as water, so taking away physical life 
from an individual destroys that individual such that he no longer exists as originally created. In the same way, once eternal life is received, the individual is a new creation that cannot exist without that eternal life, it being an intrinsic part of that individual forever by definition. So it is, <clears throat> it is not a viable argument to say one can lose something intrinsic as eternal life as if the individual would not be destroyed and no longer in existence and go back to the point he did not have the eternal life as part of his intrinsic makeup. Recall that one is forever intrinsically in Christ, intrinsically part of his indestructible eternal body at the point of faith in the gospel, sealed by the intrinsically indwelling Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. So, how can one lose the life in Christ apart from destroying Christ? How can the eternal body of Christ be lost? How can the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit in one be destroyed? Point 11. A believer has been saved completely in the past with an ongoing present result forever. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this salvation, neuter gender, faith is feminine, salvation is neuter, not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So you have been saved, once saved, always saved. Perfect tense, you have been saved. Point in time and ongoing present results forever. So, Kenneth Weiss says, so now comes the interjection. By grace you have been saved. So we have here in the Greek what is called the paraphrastic construction of the verb. Paul deliberately uses a paraphrastic construction, i.e. using an auxiliary verb, este, meaning have, or been, second person, plural, present indicative statement of fact, along with sesusmenoi, saved rather than the normative inflected verb of the form of the verb, to be saved in the past tense in order to stress the point of permanency. So, by grace you are having been saved, literally. So the paraphrastic construction is used when the writer can't get all of the details of action from one verbal form, so he uses two, a finite verb and a participle. The participle here is in the perfect tense, which tense speaks of an action that took place in past time and was completed in past time, having results in existence in present time, sometime in the past, but I'm going present results in present time, forever and ever and ever. The translation reads more accurately, by grace have you been completely saved for the present tense result that you are saved in a, in a saved being, state, state of being. Perfect tense speaks of the existence of finished results in present time. But Paul is not satisfied with showing the existence of finished ver results in present time. He wants to show the persistence of results through present times as well. So he uses the verb to be in the present tense, which gives durative force to the finished results. Thus, the full translation is, by grace you have been saved in past time completely with the result that you are in a state of salvation which persists through present time. The unending state of the believer in salvation could not have been more put in stronger or, or clearer language. The finished results of the past act of salvation are always result, present with the reader. His present state of salvation is dependent upon one thing and one thing only, his past appropriation of the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior through the, that moment of faith alone, in Christ alone. His initial act of faith brought him salvation in its three aspects, justification, the removal of the guilt and penalty of sin, and the impartation of a positive righteousness, Jesus Christ himself, an act <coughs> which occurs at the moment of believing, and a position that remains static for time and eternity. Sanctification, positional, the act of the Holy Spirit taking the believer, sinner, the leaving sinner out of the first Adam with his Adam sin and death and placing him in the last Adam, Jesus Christ, with his righteousness and life, an act that occurs at the moment of believing and sanctification progressive, the process by which the Holy Spirit eliminates sin from the experience of the believer and produces his fruit 
gradually conforming him into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ.